Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. We have a special guest in Manila today. We've long wanted to bring her to Manila and she's here. Please join me in welcoming Helen Clark. She's former New Zealand Prime Minister, but most recently looking at global policies and issues as the head of the UNDP. She's the UNDP Administrator. Hello, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to see you again. Nice to be back in Manila. I know. Well, you know, I've seen you in different parts of the world when you were New Zealand Prime Minister in Jakarta and then, you know, this most recent work. And I think you're in a unique position to tell us exactly, while you were with the UNDP, right, what are the key things you saw? What, what, what trends, what problems are we dealing with today? What's changed? I think there were two big things. Firstly, when I went, uh, I used to get speech notes that said the number of conflicts in the world is down. By 2011, they couldn't say that because yeah. we had the series of uprisings in the Arab states, right. some of which, of course, never have ended. Right. Uh, and secondly, we had uh, the intensification of the issues in Central African Republic and Mali and the Afghanistan war took on new uh, dimensions. So this forced displacement crisis with over 65 million people uh, out of their homes, either in their country or as refugees. This is unprecedented yeah. in human history. And secondly, the trend I saw was the intensification of the effects of, of this extreme climate. It's climate change. Climate change. Look, the Philippines got the, the worst of it with uh, Typhoon Yolanda. Yes. But this is the face of the future because the weather will worsen for decades to come, even if the Paris Agreement is implemented in full. So I think for me, those were the two big things I saw happen in that time. Of course, we made advances in a lot of areas. We made advances in health and education and poverty reduction. But in these bigger trends, there was, there was a lot that was negative happening. And while you were dealing with this, did you see what worked in dealing with this? Well, what will work, but right, it's so long it wasn't term, it, yeah, exactly. uh, is there's no short term fix on prevention of conflict, right? Uh, in the 2030 agenda, it talks about no sustainable development without peace and no peace without sustainable development. That is so true. Yeah. It, before the Tunisian uprising, for example, the UNDP Human Development Report pronounced Tunisia to be one of the fastest movers on human development. Yeah. But people didn't have voice and agency, they couldn't express themselves, there were frustrations, it all boiled over. Yeah. And then things can get worse before they, they get better. So we can't see development in a, in a sort of technocratic vacuum where we address economy and education and health, but don't look at the broader context of the society. If you really want to sustain development, you have to have peace. That means social cohesion, it means voice, it means being able to express, work things through. And we're a long way from that in a lot of countries. Um, if anything, it seems like it's gotten more uh, uncertain uh, Very from uncertain. 2011 until now. Right? Very uncertain. So I think we're in an age where volatility is absolutely the new normal. It's the new normal in the economy. We saw with the global financial crisis how the poorest countries on earth were affected by shenanigans in the financial markets of, uh, of the West. Uh, but what I also noticed in my years at UNDP was how political disruption also could throw markets completely out of kilter. So for example, the Greek crisis. Now yes, Greece is a small yes. economy in the European Union, but the Greek crisis had ramifications right through the European Everyone. Union. Yeah. And for an economy the size and force of the European Union, that has global uh, importance. So these political disruptions in the economy, and then there's the huge disruption that's coming from technology. Everybody's talking about it artificial intelligence and robotics and the fourth industrial revolution. Yes. Now, societies are going to have to have very smart strategies to deal with that, and I suspect many are barely thinking of it. Right. Mm. Um, when we met uh, in 2015, I think, um, mm. a while ago, we were mm. really talking mm. about this mm. technology's potential to do great good to help mm. countries like the Philippines jumpstart mm. development, mm. right? Mm. The nir nirvana of it. I mean, mm. what role is, you, you said, this mm. disruption of technology, mm. but from that kind of uh, idealistic view of technology, um, mm. where are we? How has it changed in your mind and um, how, how will it move forward? I think there's two ways of looking at it. Firstly, if you look at how the world traditionally developed, it went from subsistence agriculture into uh, manufacturing and manufacturing was 
was uh, labour intensive. And that model uh, developed Europe, it developed North America, it developed eventually uh, Japan, Korea, East Asia, Southeast Asia. But with robotics, mm. there's not going to be a lot of intensive manufacturing. So if your model was predicated on that as the way forward, it is not going to happen. What does this mean for Africa with the many least developed and low-income countries? Right. It means that Laos and Cambodia couldn't develop the way Vietnam or the right. Philippines or, or others right. did on manufacturing. So, so there's all of that. How do we equip citizens for a, a different sort of economy? And that means investing much more broadly in education, lateral thinking, entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship, people being able to create their own job, uh, a lot of, lot of issues there. Now secondly with technology, what I think is one of the phenomena of our times is that out of a very open society like the United States you get the innovation and ideas which create the social media. But the social media are now being used by other forces to create societies that aren't open and tolerant and we're, we're seeing the impacts of that. Uh, <laughs> across our television screens every day as well. So yes, it can be a tremendous force for good and I like to think that you know, I'm one of those who use it for good to talk about important you causes and issues and draw attention. But I'm also aware of the capacity of, of social media and the internet uh, for, for a dark net, for, for, for forces which are you know, malign, which are not conducive to a peaceful and harmonious society and world. Do you see any, so uh, November last year, freedomhouse.org came out with a study. They looked at 65 countries around the world and they said that in 30 of these countries, democracy is rolling back because of cheap armies on social media that is you know, stifling yeah. dissent and, and fabricating reality. Yes. Um, is there, a, in, from what you've seen, is there a, an acknowledgement of this? Is there, are there solutions getting put in place? Well, I think we need, uh, societies to be frankly better educated, to be media literate. How many societies in the school curriculum ever teach media literacy, teach mm -hmm. people to think critically, to, to say well what is the evidence, I need to know more about that before I believe that. Uh, really so many take things at face value and in this day and age where you have dedicated troll factories, <laughs> that's <laughs> That's not the recipe for a, yeah. for, for, for a good outcome. Yeah. So I am concerned about the way in which the, the open society in a sense is turning in on itself because yes. of the degree of manipulation. Um, of course our countries in Southeast Asia are particularly vulnerable because our institutions are weak and there tends to be, um, it's easy, it's cheap for these armies on social media. Mm. Myanmar, Cambodia, mm. um, the Philippines, mm. Indonesia even, I think there's a lot. Mm. We're seeing greater, greater restraints mm. on what democracy is mm. used to be. It's not, it's not only this region though, you look at the trends in, in Europe where an issue like uh, migration uh, yeah, brings out a lot of racism in societies right. and is influencing uh, elections uh, and referenda very much uh, in Europe and, and also I, I would suggest in the United States itself. So we do have a number of disturbing trends. Uh, there's also uh, the, the phenomena now in, in some of the European Union countries for quite authoritarian governments who are challenging the European Union's own culture of values. Uh, the, the extent of organised crime and connections into uh, governments in Europe is now attracting a lot of attention. The murder of a journalist and his fiancée in Slovakia, which right. has deeply shocked uh, the population there because of the investigation he was doing into organised crime. So it, this is not a, a, a good period, shall we say, and we do need, I think, citizens to be saying enough. This is not the sort of society we want to live in where there's impunity, orchestrated killings, uh, no one ever held to account. You know, we don't want this sort of world. Um, the rise of the of populist leaders. I mean, let me let me pull one strand because there's so much in what you just said. But the rise of populist leaders around the world was this helped by technology, by social oh, media. Oh yeah, yeah. They, they proved very adept at, at using it. Uh, last year, I was on a panel at the Council of Europe's major annual forum on on democracy, and the panel was challenged with the topic, is populism a bad thing? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, it is. I had three reasons for that. Uh, firstly, in my observation, populism 
uh, uses uh, a minority to stigmatise and stereotype and rally support against the other. And the other could be take many forms, but it, it whips people up about a, a minority. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, populism turns against the institutions which yeah. enabled it to develop so that the populists weaken yeah. uh, institutions, which is a worry because without strong institutions, you know, society won't be harmonious and peaceful either or have rule of law. And thirdly, populists come up with very simplistic so-called solutions to yes. very complex problems, but the solutions could actually make things immensely worse. And trade protectionism is, is one of them. You know, most jobs aren't lost to open trade, they're lost to technology these days. Right, <laughs> so, right. and, protection, and protectionism's never gonna beat technology <laughs> because technology has its, its own momentum. So it was a very interesting uh, discussion in the European context to be talking about these things. Um, in terms of where you see technology going, it, it's ironic that Facebook, Twitter, Google, these are American companies, yes. and they want to encourage democracy as these countries at least, at least, right? And yet these are the companies that are now enabling populist leaders to become authoritarian leaders, to become mm. dictators. Mm. Um, and where is it going? See, they set themselves up as, pl as platforms, and we're in an irony of an age of these digital companies where Uber owns no taxis, right. where Airbnb owns no accommodation, <laughs> where Google actually supplies no content, uh, nor does Facebook or Twitter, they're platforms. Yeah, exactly. But if they're platforms without rules, that is the problem. You know, I want to live in a rules-based society, in a right. rule-based world, and I think if, if anyone's going to tackle this, it may well be the European Union that starts to look at this great unregulated space right. uh, because an unregulated space can turn in on itself and be and be damaging i need to just zoom in on russia and disinformation mm -hmm. i mean in the united states right now you have hearings that are going on that are investigations by the by the fbi looking at this um, when we look at this information and this classic case it's only been recently that mm -hmm. censorship change from from stopping publication to like flooding mm -hmm. with with uh, lies mm. and then pounding the 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 fracture lines of society mm. and many people point to Russia to how that's done it against its own citizens how it's done it in the Ukraine what mm. role do you see anything that I mean are, are mm. these autocratic populist leaders learning from each other or is this orchestrated or is there a playbook well I think almost from the time social media got a large following governments were working out how they could how use it. it. Uh, all kinds of governments were working out how they uh, they could use it. And so we see the troll factories, uh, we see the fact that uh, in other countries they don't allow the American social media companies but they have their right. own which right. can be <laughs> more, more controlled. <laughs> yes. um, and, and we see digital diplomacy. I mean the West does its digital diplomacy, right. but uh, is, is quite open about it. When Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, uh, she had quite a big social media initiative right. uh, to, to put their messages out. So, it, But what we would like to see is it used to put a case based on evidence and reason and not something that's used to interfere in political processes of or to incite us. hate and to, to stifle a narrative which was which is what we're seeing in this part in the Philippines for yeah. example. And, and then look at the the huge sophistication of terrorist organizations Isis absolutely yes. mastered the the use of the new uh, information and communications technologies with its YouTube uh, videos its sophisticated recruitment techniques so you know with technology in a sense is is, is value neutral it's, it's how it's used that's, yes. the, that's the issue. It can be used for good, but it can also demonstrably be used for ill. Global power dynamics. I mean, again, you're in a unique position. Mm. You've looked at a bird's mm. eye view, and you mm. were prime minister mm. um, in your country. It seemed also to be connected to this, how technology is also mm. both empowered and enabled populist leaders to take over, right? Mm. Uh, changes in the U.S. with Trump, changes in policies that impact globally. In the Philippines, we have the South China Sea. We also have a, a pivot. Our president said he would pivot from the United States to China and Russia. Um, 
these types of global changes, what do you see happening? I mean, the global power dynamics is, is in flux. Very, very difficult. And of course, I came from eight years working in New York, where the United Nations had a power structure that was established by the victors of World War II. Right. How so interesting, the right? The power structure looks <laughs> a little bit uh, out of date these days, because you have uh, on the Security Council, the United States, clearly a great power by any measure, China a great power by any measure, uh, you have Russia, uh, you have France and Great Britain, but hey, Germany and Japan are huge contributors to the UN, major economies, probably third and fourth biggest uh, in the world, not on the Security Council because they lost World War II. Wow. And then you have the emerging uh, countries like India, right. you know, obviously the, the, the geopolitical power and the economic power of India right. is immense. Right. Brazil, a very, very significant uh, country. So the power structure of the UN just doesn't look like the world as we know it today, but it's almost impossible to change that structure because when countries are given a veto 73 years ago, they, they don't see reasons for giving that up or for expanding uh, the number of others who might enjoy the, the same privilege. And speaking as a New Zealander, we right. never supported the veto anyway. We said it was not a good thing at the, at the outset. So, uh, you know, we went through all the Cold, year, Cold War years. Uh, the Berlin Wall falls in 89, the Soviet Union dissolves. And for a time, we had, you know, perhaps a, a more open discussion yeah. amongst uh, traditional rivals. But we're really back to what feels like uh, a new Cold War. Uh, but there's a lot more big players as well. Uh, we have multipolarity without multilateralism, you could say. So this, these are awkward times, awkward to get agreement on, on things of substance. 2015, we had an incredible year for agreement on development, but none of it involved binding treaties getting binding right. treaties, Security Council resolutions on contentious matters, this is where it gets really difficult. Can it adapt fast enough? No, it hasn't adapted fast enough. At all? No. Um, and, and that kind of, will it be relevant? Well, that is the issue, that you lose relevance if you right. can't adapt with the times. And that is a concern I have. I think for the UN with its three major mandates, I think in general, the development of the humanitarian arms are well thought of because they're there when people need them. They yes. have an ongoing presence and engagement within the society. So let's say that's been quite successful. We have the human rights pillar, which which struggles because yeah. a lot of trends are adverse. And you will exactly. hear our human rights commissioner, Prince Saeed from Jordan, uh, regularly uh, very, very distressed about the trends he sees in, in the world. And then you have the peace and security pillar uh, with a UN which was set up to stop another world war. But that's not the sort of war we're facing. Yeah. We're facing these protracted uh, civil wars with a lot of non-state actor elements to them and then the spillover effects into neighboring countries. I mean, who would have thought when the Syrian uprising began in March 2011 that it would end up with a refugee crisis in Europe that saw close to a million people heading towards Germany and the political implications that would have yeah. for a strong yeah. leader like Angela Merkel. So right. all these complex spillover effects coming from uh, some of these trends. Us against them, I mean, if you look at uh, the immigration policy in, in every country challenged by that, um, terrorism, Al-Qaeda, mm. ISIS, all based mm. on this idea of us against them. and then. Uh, now being pulled back into politics. I mean, this mm. seems like, mm. yeah, I'm depressing. I'm yeah. depressing myself. This is a, diff a more difficult world than it was, it's say, a, a decade very, ago, it's right? It's a much more difficult world than it was a decade ago. More conflict, more forced displacement, the uh, quickening pace of impact of climate change. Uh, also, because we're urbanizing so fast, uh, we're seeing more and more people crowded into spaces which are often quite precarious. Right. A lot of the world's mega cities are very vulnerable, yes. both to the major weather event and major yeah. cyclones and storms, but also to major seismic events, uh, which, you know, I mean, look at Dakar in, in Bangladesh, a yes. major earthquake there 
one, one shivers to think of what the consequence could, could be. Here in the Philippines we're talking about you know, this big one and we've been trying to prepare for it. And it will happen because you're on the ring of fire. It's a question of whether it happens in this geological millennium or, or the next. It could be tomorrow, it could be 3,000 years, but <laughs> it's, it's going to be bad when it happens. For many years, we talked about hashtag 2030 now, and we were trying to work for these global development goals. I mean, are you optimistic of reaching any of these? I, I think the agenda is right, yes. and, and it's, it's complemented by the Paris Climate Agreement yeah, yeah. and by the Senbai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction, which is very important, and also by the Addis Ababa Action Agenda on Financing. So all of this is good. Uh, the question is to keep the focus on these things uh, while there are so many distractions, endless distractions. I think the other way in which the 2015 agreements broke new ground was with Sustainable Development yeah. Goal 16 and the explicit acknowledgement that you don't get sustainable development without peace and, and vice versa. And so we have the goal that talks about peaceful and inclusive societies based on the rule of law mm. and people having voice and governments <laughs> being representative and responsive and lowering the level of violence in societies. This is very, very important. This seems like in a weird way right now, I mean, it's only been two years, of, but it, it's a civilized world of policy and what we're living through in, in countries that have populist um, mm -hmm. leaders mm -hmm. is the opposite of that. How do, you, how, how, we, how do we pull them together? Well, you know, look, wheels turn full circle. So countries are capable of electing very, very different leaders. You know, look, look at a, a great democracy like the United States. United States yeah. It can elect Bill Clinton, it can elect George Bush, it can uh, elect Barack Obama, it can elect Donald Trump. These men are all so different. Right. But they all commanded a majority in the electorate. But you know, things change. People have a go, the next one comes, they have a go. If the institutions are strong, yeah. the That's society the critical will part, stand right? Up. The institutions. And That's as the, the institutions get weaker, yes. then we have greater problems. Yeah. Um, one analyst I spoke with said that this particular moment in times feels like that moment before uh, the shot heard around the world before World War One, and then mm -hmm. how do we prevent this kind of conflict. Do you see anything? First, do you agree with that? Is it that? Uh, I, th I think it's tense times, but we have to keep talking. Yes. Right. Personally, I hope the meeting between Donald Trump and Kim Jong Un comes off. It's always better that people talk than that they not talk. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. So we have to keep talking across different types of government, across uh, across societies. And we have to come back, I think, to the focus on the positive agendas, which are around Paris climate and, and SDGs, and say leaders did agree on a vision mm. for a better world. Now, there's a whole lot of concrete steps we could take towards that and, and really support everyone in the society that's under pressure to be able to, to, to do what they can uh, to make a difference. I'm going to end with Helen Clark. I mean, mm. um, you know, women around the world now uh, are more targeted. Uh, we think we've moved forward, but on social media, for example, the, uh, the attacks are three times against women in, in the developed world. Uh, as a women leader today, mm. first, lessons you've learned that you want to push forward, and then um, what, what, what do you think these times, um, what challenges do they give to uh, women leaders today? So I think at, at the global level, uh, we've hit a roadblock. And the Global Gender Gap Report of the World Economic Forum uh, reported last year that the trend was negative. Right, mm -hmm. fewer women heads of state and government. It will take longer to achieve uh, uh, parity in the workplace. They actually said 217 years for parity in the workplace across wages, seniority, and participation on current trends. Completely unacceptable. Yeah, they yeah, said yeah. 99 years for global parity of women and. In, in, in legislatures. We saw Hillary Clinton hit a glass seat. Yeah. You know, a very well qualified candidate. We saw no woman elected for Secretary General you know, for the ninth election right. uh, in, in a row. Uh, and, but we then see the Me Too movement. Yes. And I take encouragement mm. from that mm. because I see women standing up and saying, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. <laughs> and it started the chain reaction. They're not going to put up with it. Women are speaking out across all sectors of economy and society mm. saying, this happened to me and it's got to change. So you have to have 
uh, that kind of catalyst, I think, for, for change. And it is motivating a younger generation of women. Now, you know, coming from New Zealand, we have our third woman prime minister. Uh -huh. Women have held every significant position in New Zealand. Uh, we still have work to do, but you know, we have a 37-year-old woman prime minister. She's about to have a baby and take maternity leave. Young women are so excited by this. Yeah, you know, exactly. She's become a, a global role model. Yeah, so, when she visited here, yeah, she, so there's she positive stood out. things. There's positive things, and let's hang on to the positives and use these as examples of what could be. Your advice for other women. I mean, what things have worked for you? And uh... well, uh, we have to be very resilient mm. because uh, when you come forward to contest positions of power, actually, whether you're male or female, other people want them. So you've yes. got to be very resilient. Yes. And often, women, I think, you think, oh God, that looks so horrific, so nasty. But we have to step up. Now, never step up on your own without support. You have to have networks around you. Mm -hmm. Your family support's important. Your colleagues, your, the alliances that you, you make. And you have to be prepared to persevere over a very long period of time. <laughs> From the time I, I joined my political party to uh, when I became Prime Minister, well, it was from you know, 1972 to 1999. It's quite a long haul. I was 18 years a member of parliament before I became prime minister, and I had a lot of, lot of low points in that, you know, as we lost elections and so on. So, yeah, just take the long-term view and hang in there. If it's important enough, you'll build the resilience to deal with it. Um, your last thoughts, I mean, this is, you're back yeah. in the Philippines, you know, um, mm. advice for us as we move forward in this very complex world. Very complex. Well, I think, uh, you know, Philippines has a young and dynamic population. Uh, it's articulate, uh, it's, it's social media savvy, and I just say to young people, use your voice. The future's about you. It's not about people of my age, it's about you. So, you know, be clear on what you want your future to be, what, you, what kind of society you want for your children to grow up in. Mm -hmm. Use your voice. That's my advice. What we're seeing is, I mean, do you see values changing globally? Because again, as, as mm -hmm. the, these troll armies go on social media, as more populist leaders mm -hmm. come and take control in other countries, mm -hmm. uh, values seem to be shifting because of this globally connecting world. Is, is that, do you see that or not so well, much? Uh, when I meet young people almost anywhere in the world, organized youth civil society, I always feel optimistic because you're seeing the best side of, of a country. I feel optimistic when I meet young people in my, my own country. I think what we need is a, a lot more investment, as I say, in media literacy and uh, just general awareness of the state of the world, a knowledge of history, because if you don't understand the lessons of history, you are yeah. doomed to repeat, repeat it. them. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we do see some of that around. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we, we, we need to support young people to be able to analyze for themselves what's really happening around here and what the consequences of things can be. Fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. We've been speaking with Helen Clark. If you're on Twitter, it, her handle is at Helen Clark NZ. Um, thank you for coming, and we'll see you. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs>